This is tape number two. Uh, I'm talking with Clint Olson at his home in Bend, Oregon. Uh, the date is March 8, 1995. My name is Ron Gregory, and the tape belongs to me. And uh, so we're talking about uh, lemon rang pie. pie and slop holes. And what was the lady's name? Oh, um, Mildred Shock. She had a funeral about two months ago, and they mentioned the fact that Charlie enjoyed the lemon rang pie my mother made, and my mother taught Millie how to make lemon meringue pie, but in the process, <laughs> she said she had to fill up one slop hole <laughs> with lemon meringue pies before she got the right mixture and, and made the right way. So what all what all went into the slop hole? Just about anything that uh, you didn't want? Yeah. Cans? Cans and, 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 you know, your garbage. Glass. It's just a garbage hole. Yeah. Yeah. Glass and maybe yeah. broken dishes or yeah. tools that don't work, maybe toys that kids don't want anymore. Yeah, well, sometimes kids would open it up and just drop it in there and see, yeah. them, see them fall in. Okay. But uh, that's a, another cultural resource there. Sure, you bet. Yeah. And almost every house, every family had their own slop hole. Okay. Uh, how close was it to the root cellar? Uh, it it depends on most places where we had camp it was easy digging you could put them about anywhere you want and before they got the indoor plumbing the slop hole would be between the the uh, root cellar was right outside the door so as soon as you stepped on the porch you could step on the, on the entrance to the root cellar and then as you walk back along the house to the back of the house where you may have a garage is where your outdoor toilet was but halfway between would be the would be your uh slop hole okay you'd go from from the kitchen door past the root cellar past the slop hole to the outdoor toilet <laughs> okay but it, at, beginning at the lapine camp you didn't have outhouses anymore did you Oh, we did, we did to start with. Yeah. Okay. But sometime mm -hmm. afterwards, the indoor plumbing yeah. and the indoor toilets kicked in, and, yeah. and you didn't have the outhouses, but you still had the slop holes for your garbage. Yeah, we we uh, you know, not everybody had the uh, facility or the amount of money to to build an indoor bathroom, so they continued to use. The, okay. The the uh, toilets that were built by the WPA. They call them WPA or mm -hmm. they had the concrete base. And they, they used to haul those, move them right with the camp. They had the hunting wagon. You're right. Hunting <laughs> dippers, sir. Yeah, they'd pick up the toilets. Uh, the toilets were a prefabricated type of building that sat on top of this concrete base that was about four, maybe five feet square. I think it was about five feet square. And it had the the lid and the, everything was hooked up to the door. When you open the door, the lid would fall down. Okay. So let me get this straight, though. Uh, uh, sometime after the Lapine camp, you got indoor plumbing. Some folks got indoor toilets, but some folks still continued to use outhouses. Yeah. yeah they uh, during the Lapine camp is when they started. Uh, using flush toilets and and by the time we moved from there to the summer camp more people were digging uh, septic tank, uh, cesspools and, and stuff like but that. But did people still continue to use uh, outhouses in some cases at yeah, summer camp if, also? Like yeah, if they didn't have the money mm -hmm. to put in a, a toilet and, but it was simple to do and they they became popular. Sure, uh, oh, convenience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, in terms of the bachelors, uh, where were where were they located uh, in relationship to the rest of the camp, to the the family homes and whatnot? Well, well, Pine Camp, they were on the east end of the camp. They were separated by the grocery store and the barber shop and we had a barber shop by the way mm -hmm. and a uh, appliance store when we got electricity we had 
Elmer Scaff started selling uh, radios and, mm-hmm. and mix masters and toasters and all that stuff. And that, that was right. The merchandisers, <laughs> the, our grocery store and the barber shop and Elmer Scaff's uh, electrical store and then uh, the Hodge Brothers. Uh, garage where it, where it was between the, the regular camp and the uh, area out there that was bunk houses that were on the railroad tracks right next to the roundhouse and the powerhouse and the blacksmith shop and the, and the truck shop. Do you suppose any effort was made to uh, kind of separate the bachelors from the, the family housing and whatnot? Did the families feel like uh, well, you know, you got this. No, uh, and, and it wasn't like that. It was just if you were a bachelor, you lived in the bachelor quarters up there, and uh, that's where they were. I mean, they didn't they didn't try to integrate them or anything like that. It's just that's where the the bunk houses were on one end of the camp, and and the uh, family houses were all on the other end. And down at uh, Shamal Camp, the bunk houses, I think they had the best location because they were on the south side of the camp on the bottom of this huge hill that we were that was an odd camp it was built on a hillside mm. of course it gave us more pressure and the, the water was pumped sure and uh, but what what sort of living arrangements did the bachelors have i mean what what were their quarters like it was one room and uh, one man to one room yeah, yeah. yes uh, and I guess back in the early 30s, the state went through and most of the bunkhouses were just flat roof then. And then the state went through and found out that there wasn't enough space in air, I guess, and they made them build cupolas mm-hmm. on top of the bunkhouses. With windows in them yeah. and the light, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. I guess they say now that, you know, lighting can make a difference in your mood, so it, it probably helped. Yeah. Uh, well, what what else? Did did the company provide anything as far as uh, bedding and... Oh, yeah. They they, fly, they had the, the, the beds and the mattresses. The sheets and... No, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess they did produce the sheets and, and that way. And they had cupboards and stove and... Uh, usually a chair, a wooden chair. If you liked an easy chair, you had to buy your own. Mm-hmm. And if you you wanted your sheets washed, you might you'd wash it yourself, or you might find uh, some woman in in mm-hmm. camp who did laundry. Or yeah. Right? The company didn't provide washing the sheets or anything. Or this gentleman that took care of the bathhouse, he might be have a little side job, or he. He'd uh, wash, uh, wash your linen for you. The uh, one that I remember the best was old William B. Means. Nobody knew that name. His name, according to everybody in camp, was Whiskey Bill. Whiskey Bill. It, was there a reason why? Yes. <laughs> what was that? He, he was drunk all the time. He, he was an alcoholic. First water. <laughs> well, well what the the logging superintendent think about that? Well, as long as he got his job done. Yeah. There, there wasn't. It, he wouldn't get that drunk during the day. He'd just get drunk every night and then wake up for a hangover. Yeah. <laughs> well, how did the company feel about alcohol in the camp? Did they have any, you know, well, they, problems with that or? Uh, I'm not too sure about back in the prohibition days, but I know there was alcohol there and. Uh, Bootleggers come in and sell it, but uh, the Croatians and the uh, Yugoslavians, they used to make their own wine. They did right up until 1950 when they sold out. And they'd go down to Southern California and buy a load of Benzendale grapes and make their own wine, which well, was good wine. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, what about, you know, during Prohibition out in the woods? Uh, men have stills out there? Or was there no, no. Having stills out they there? wouldn't have time. They wouldn't really. have time, huh? <laughs> And 
alcohol was forbidden and working because it was too dangerous. Sure. In fact, my dad told me, he said, back in the 20s, it was so dangerous and they didn't have a, enough training to train people how to be careful out in the woods. They usually kill one man a week. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to talk about that a little later. Uh, right now, though, I'd like to ask you about the cookhouse. Tell me, you know, something about the cookhouse, for example, you know, the size of the building and... and uh, it was a... Uh, just a moment, my father was one of the cooks in the cookhouse. Mm -hmm. But as far as, as the cookhouse, uh, was it big, small? Yeah, it was one of those. They had two sizes of railroad cars that were used um, for different things, like the, uh, the large railroad car was... Uh, divided into six bunker houses for six individual men. So it's probably 10 by 16 for that. But this large 60 foot, 16 by 60 foot cookhouse, and about two thirds of it was devoted to tables, picnic type tables with, with bench seats. And uh, about one third of it was the was the kitchen. Okay, so it remained on the rails. Oh yeah, like, like the bachelor's quarters. Yeah, okay. it was a Wang ashless stove, commercial type. Okay. Uh, did all members of the community were they entitled to eat at the cookhouse if they wanted? Or um, I don't know if they were entitled, but usually it was just for the bachelors. It was. Okay. But. And I imagine you could get fed if you came down there, and, and uh, I don't know if they charged, how much they charged for that, or later on, I know they did charge, but at first, I don't think it was, it was just part of the job. It know? wasn't something that was taken out of each man's no. wages or anything like that, so the company provided the meal yeah. know, for the bachelor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what meals were served there at the cookhouse? You can get breakfast. You'd have a sack lunch that you'd take out into the woods. Mm -hmm. okay. Two or three sandwiches, uh, usually an apple or some type of fruit. They were well fed, though. Okay. And the dinners then were back in the cookhouse. Okay. Uh, quantities of food was mountains of mountains of it. Yeah, uh, my mother was uh, asked to come and be a waitress by my grandfather, mm -hmm. that was a cook and she moved into camp in uh, early 19, probably 1919, way back then, she, she came to camp. And uh, she was really frustrated with the loggers in the morning when they'd come in for breakfast. She'd go around and pour their cup full of coffee they had the heavy ceramic cup that the Navy and the, the Navy used especially, that real kind of hourglass with a big, right. big handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, they pour the, the cups full of coffee. Loggers come in, throw the first cup of coffee on the floor. Heat up the cup. Yeah. <laughs> and she said she got so angry at those guys throwing the coffee on the floor because they had to clean the floor up. You know, they, the they, way she did. Yeah. Yeah, the loggers didn't. They just they threw it on the floor, had breakfast, and left. That's right. Okay. He had to clean up the mess. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, were there any special kinds of features uh, that the cookhouse had, like the homes as far as cellars for storing quantities of food? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. they, uh, they had a huge root cellar at one time, and then later on, I think maybe that was the inspiration for this uh, portable a root cellar. They had a, a a regular building the size of a garage that had uh, perishables in there. And uh, I think at one time they had an insulated room in the uh, you had the cookhouse and uh, the seating, but behind the cook beyond the cookhouse 
was a insulated room where the meat, quarters of meat were hung in this cooper. Okay, now was this a root cellar type or was this a prefab one? Now this was built into that okay. 60 foot railroad car. Okay. And you walk, walk and I, as I remember now, it's one side. So it'd be about uh, eight feet wide and 16 feet long or something like that, maybe 20 feet long. And it was insulated with that great big door that you used to. So it was, it was cool. Yeah, it was a cooler. That's what cool. it was. Yeah. It was built right in into that next railroad car. And behind that was a warehouse full of canned goods. Okay, okay. Uh, and then later on, they uh, they built another, like the uh, portable uh, cellars that was about the size of a garage. Okay. So again, as time went by from camp to camp, uh, at the Lapine camp, you might find a large cellar there that had been associated with the, the cookhouse. Cookhouse, yeah. but then at Summit, uh, there might not be one. Perhaps they were using one of these uh, prefab fabricated storage yeah. places. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the cooler uh, was always, for the most part, attached to the cookhouse itself. Well, it was uh, on another railroad car. Okay, you know, and the, yeah. the railroad cars were hooked together with the regular. Right, right. And you regular. just walked across from the cookhouse. Yeah, and yeah. The they built that. Okay. But it was on rails. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what was the atmosphere like in the cookhouse? Was it, you know, were the meals kind of rowdy and boisterous or oh, yeah, they, uh, orderly? No, they didn't get too loud, but if they got too loud, somebody would tell them shut up. And, yeah. But uh, it, it was more or less, you know, back in the old days when they were using a cookhouse, it was like one big family. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't fit in, you were kind of ostracized, but they didn't do that much to anybody that I ever heard about. You know, it, it, there was always a lot of kidding going on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no seating arrangements, you basically sat where you wanted, or? Well, I'm not sure. I think some of those old, the old crotchety bloggers, they kind of like sit in the same place all the time. Creatures of habit. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about, you know, you talk about lots of food, mountains of food. Uh-huh. Uh, was all of that eaten during a meal? Well, yeah, they'd, they'd bring out enough that you never ran out, but they had a supply car that would come out depending on how much food they needed. They had a regular supply car that did have a built-in cooler in it for hauling the meat out from Bend or wherever the camp was, mm -hmm. and plus all the other canned goods they had ordered. But well, what about after meals? What about waste? Did, did the men eat everything that was prepared for them, or well, were there mountains of food maybe left over after the meal that had to be tossed out? Yeah, and they, they had a slop hole right in the floor. Oh, they did? Of the cookhouse. Okay. And they, they had a slop sled. And one of the jobs my dad made for himself was taking the slop sled down to feed the pigs. He, he, uh, he was raising pigs with the garbage that the company threw away, okay. and then he'd sell the pigs to the company. So, <laughs> it, it, uh, good, good uh, entrepreneur there. <laughs> so, uh, the cookhouse on the rails, mm -hmm. it, it sat over its own particular slop hole? No, it, no, they had a slop sled. See, okay. look at that picture. Where is that picture of the, my mom? And, yeah. See how high that is? Mm -hmm. See that the rails are here in the uh, wheels. See, this is a building that's built on a flat car. Mm -hmm. See, this this must be about six feet above. See, be about that high above the ground. Uh -huh. See, because your your rails were a foot high above the ground to start with. Yeah. Then the rail, then the wheels, and then the bottom of that uh, cookhouse. That's the cookhouse. Okay. Was about this high. And that's that. that so then. The, the They're sitting on the steps, see? Okay, so the garbage that came off of the men's uh, plates and whatnot went down a trough and went into a sled. No, it just went straight down to, to a sled. It was right underneath the hole, over right there. It went right into the sled. It okay. didn't fly in anywhere. It went okay, okay, so <laughs> what what did they do with the material in the sled? You say your dad used that to yeah. slop the hogs. Yeah. Okay, he, okay, let me ask you, though. There was a, another thing I got to bring out, too. Okay. 
the fact that you wouldn't find any fruit in that slop sled. Why is Because that? my grandfather, because there was a fire going all the time in the cookhouse stove, had a still. I did. Okay. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that <laughs> before, yeah. Huh. Especially peaches and pears and things like that. Okay, so what about uh, like the family housing and whatnot? What about uh, the cookhouses, cans and bottles and broken ceramic ware? Uh, did they have a, a, a garbage pit? like the individual houses that they would toss their cans and bottles into, or how was that disposed of? I don't know. You know, that perplexes me because they're at the cliff camp. There seems to be a garbage pit just for the cookhouse. Mm -hmm. But I think later, when we moved to the, the pine camp, the uh, one of the swampers that ran a ton-and-a-half Chevrolet truck to pick up the garbage, the cans and stuff, and take them to the large communal dump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, this is something that, that troubles me also, you know, at these camps that we come across during the cultural resource surveys, is that oftentimes, you know, we come across tremendous cans or uh, dumps of cans. And of course, the can or the dumps contain cans that were quantity size. But commercial. Yeah, they were, they were something. commercial size or gallon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they might be, oh, 80 foot long by maybe 20 or 30 feet wide, and there's no idea of knowing how deep these things are. And you're usually about, when they're made by a bulldozer, they don't get much below the top of the bulldozer. Okay. So they're 8, 10 feet deep. Okay. But as, as you look at those cans, sometimes the uh, cook would use a cleaver mm -hmm. to open the can. Right. Whack, whack, yeah. 90 degrees apart. But, but and, these, I'm sorry, go ahead. And well, as they developed a better can opener, you know, they'd use the can opener later right. on. Right. But these, these features were associated with the cookhouse. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, they would have had to have been. Yeah. So, they, you know, a lot of it they weren't necessarily taking out to a dump another place. No, away. not until not until later on in the Lapine Camp and where we had a regular dump site. Okay, which was located at, at some distance from the camp. And that's about a half a mile from okay. the camp. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that's not very far, really. Mm -mm. Uh, okay. Luckily, mm -hmm. we didn't get our water or anything nearby. Our water came from up near Plano Lake. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, at the was, at the Pine Camp. Yeah, there was yeah. no contamination there. Okay, well with these swap holes, you know, that kind of raises another question as far as uh, uh, vermin. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever have coyotes coming into the area or no. you know, what about flies? Well, if they're closed properly, there wouldn't be too many flies. There's always a few, but you had chipmunks <laughs> yeah. digging the holes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one more question about the, the camp cookhouse. Uh, when you moved camp from one location to another, did Shevlin Hickson have a policy or a procedure for dealing with the refuse or these slop holes uh, that it had accumulated over time and would be being left behind? No, uh, no. They, they probably just throw some dirt on them. I mean, when we moved camp, uh, a lot of these holes got uh, just by moving their houses around, got dirt kicked into them. And okay, and so they... They get, usually pick up that uh, six by six platform that covered the slop hole and take that with them. Too. Okay, so, so in yarding the houses from the, the house site to the rail, mm -hmm. was it possible that the houses might go over the top of these slop holes or maybe even over root cellars and flatten things out or maybe Yeah, they could. Okay, and it might even broadcast the materials around. Yeah, but if there if it was gonna cause any problem a caterpillar driver would try to avoid getting hung up in the slop hole or a root cellar. Okay. My reason for asking this, uh, Cliff, is that you know, again, you know, when we're out there on those sites, uh, oftentimes what we see uh, is uh, materials that 
are kind of scattered over a broad area. Well, you have a lot of bottle collectors that came out about 10 years ago. Uh, but these and are they were a prime uh, area for looking for bottles. Sure, sure. And they tore into a lot of those. Yeah, one of the other things I've noticed, though, is that oftentimes uh, much of the materials are burned. The cans are burned, but and the bottles, the glass, is all melted. Yeah. So what I've wondered is, you know, in, in leaving these places, if, you know, the company might have gone in and dozed the area after having left, or if some of the materials might have even been burned. Yeah, uh, if they thought there was a chance of, uh, you know, too much uh, disease from anything like that, they probably would throw a can of gas in there and light it. Yeah, okay. To help eliminate the problem of, of disease developing out of that. Do, do you ever re recall uh, whether after having left the, the campsite that it was, it was leveled? Or those? No. No, you don't. Okay. And Isabel and Valerie. This is a Valerie, Isabel, Annette, and Florence. Okay. Uh, one other thing about uh, just the, the camp as far as families and the cookhouse. Uh, where did Chevron Hickson purchase food supplies for the camp? Uh, did they, have, um, did they have a primary person they dealt with? Or? Yeah, they had a warehouse in here in Bend that uh, made the contacts with the wholesalers. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in those days, I remember Wadhams. Wadhams? Oh, yeah, it was one of the uh, dealers. Then the Pacific Produce was... Uh, by it from them. Yeah. I'd often heard rumors from people, or uh, maybe I just got the impression from newspaper articles that that uh, uh, Ericsson's kind of built their company off of uh, the logging firms and, yeah. and dealing with them. Any truth to that? that you well, know? they they might have supplied a lot of. I know one thing when we ran the store in the camp, we had our own meat supply from O'Donnell meat market here in Bend. They wholesaled meat to us. And Erickson would come out there with a bottle egg with a cooler on the back selling meat oh, in camp. Is that right? They'd deliver meat right to your door. How about that? So Competition. Yeah. Okay, so Erickson did deal with yeah. the camps then? Yeah. Okay, okay. Huh. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about the the schools a little bit. Uh, did Chevlin Hickson provide schooling uh, yes. for the kids in the mm -hmm. camp community? They did. Yeah, my mother was one of the teachers, too. Mm -hmm. They had a uh, school for the younger children uh, up until the time we moved to the, the Pines. And then in 1932, they bought a Rio Speedwagon bus, the largest school bus in Oregon, mm -hmm. 75 People. Yeah, I remember you were talking that about that the last time. Genuine leather seat. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Big outfit, huh? Yeah. So yeah. this, so the schools then were... Uh, uh, they were with the camp. They uh, they had school teachers and they did have a, a camp. I, I, I remember Lois Gumpert saying that she was in school when they were building the highway. Mm -hmm. When uh, the camp site was located right there where the Fall River turnoff is. Okay. And she used to watch them. They were building the railroad and the highway about that time. And the kids would get out of school and watch, watch them building those two things. There. And, and the company hired the teachers yeah, and uh -huh. paid their wages mm -hmm. and uh, paid for school supplies and whatnot? Yeah. Okay. And, and the school itself, was, was that a separate building? Yeah, it was one of those. Uh, <laughs> One of those houses on wheels, those okay. sixty-foot okay. cars. It didn't uh, I guess what I was getting at is that it didn't serve necessarily a, a dual purpose. There were enough no. kids in the camp that we need a schoolhouse. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what grades were taught there? Well, up up until uh, grade school, I guess I I'm not sure about this because. Lee Maker might know more about it. He he remembers the school at the uh, cliff camp. Mm -hmm. But all I remember is going to school when I was six years old in La Pine. Okay. And I started the first grade in La Pine. Okay. I went from that until I was sophomore in high school. 
So prior to uh, moving to the Lapine camp, Shevlin Hicks and supplied teachers and the schoolhouse and mm -hmm. the school supplies. Once you moved to the Lapine camp, which was relatively close to Lapine, then the yeah. kids went to Lapine. Lapine. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, what about churches? Uh, they had a community hall that was used as a church, and uh, it was none of those 60 foot cars that were. Oh, it was another 60 foot Yeah, car. yeah. This, uh, it was, had pews and everything in it, and it was used primarily for movies okay so it was it they, was multifunctional yeah okay uh -huh. this was this was a community center you see. yeah okay but and it also there well, were also religious services yeah well redden one of the uh, pastor redden pastor of the pines he called himself he lived out on that uh, old ben redmond highway mm -hmm. between here and where it, uh, there was a, a dairy out there. He owned a dairy, and he was a pastor of the pines. So was he like a traveling evangelist in a way? Uh, did he no, he, he just went out to camp, and he went out to the camp, and he had his own church here in town, I guess. Okay. Okay. But you could look him up, R-E-D-D-E-N. Okay, I think I've seen pictures of him in maybe Pine Echoes or even maybe the Equalizer. I can't. He he had his he, a picture of him with his uh, posed with his foot on the largest ponderosa yeah. in the world. You've probably seen that picture. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, another case of uh, the religion. Uh, my mother was raised uh, by nuns, and she was a teaching uh, sister in Portland mm -hmm. at the uh, Holy Name Society, I think. Anyway. But uh, that's one of the reasons she helped teach too here, but as far as church goes, she introduced uh, Father Sheehan to the fact that we had a lot of Catholics out, being the Croatians and mm -hmm. the Yugoslavians, a lot of Catholics in the camp. Mm -hmm. So we started holding Catholic church in our living room. Oh, you did. Okay, so that Sunday. was so that was separate then from uh, the community center. Mm -hmm. People would come to your house and and you'd have the mass mass there. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, anyone ever baptized or married in the camps? Mm, I doubt it. Yeah, I mean, they usually go to band for things like that. Okay, okay. Had to. Had there to. may have been some of those evangelist type of. Preachers may have married a, a few couples out there. I don't. It's vaguely. I am vaguely trying to remember that uh, there may have been a couple, or two or three. But it, it wasn't the, the usual thing. They come to Ben. They needed a church for that. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, or go to Reno. Oh, go to Reno. Huh? Yeah. Well, that must have been a drive. <laughs> well, uh, this. Redden was was he an ordained minister? I think so. Okay. I I don't know. He <laughs> he's a dairy farmer. I know dairy that. farmer too. Okay. Well, that's okay. You can do both. Okay. Uh, okay. We we've, we've talked about family homes and bachelor quarters, the cookhouse, school, and church services. What other buildings were there, and what function did they serve in the camp? They uh, that you can recall. They had the. Uh, blacksmith shop the one I like. Why was that? Well, you know, they have the forge and and uh, originally when I first went over there and when I was a little kid, they had this huge machine as an electrical motor that ran belts, leather belts, for forty feet back and forth in a what you would call the attic of this and they had these machines that would bound and saw and and lathes and everything, it all belt operated. And, and so what sort of services did the blacksmith shop, shop perform for the company? Yeah, they built, built pieces of equipment. Now, usually they were repairing pieces of equipment like, the, like a, uh, they would buy like a skookum block, uh, a block for that big high line about three feet in diameter. And, and it, had a, it was a big pulley is what it was. Mm -hmm. And naturally, they'd break sometimes. And 
and hand welding. And Did they ever do any work on the trains or the you know the the train trucks or the locomotives or anything like that, or was that done someplace else? Well, primarily was done by a roundhouse down in Bend. Okay. They had a crew of men that did that, but when they had all the steam locomotives, and I was a hostler, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, once in a while when you have a steam locomotive, if the fireman doesn't stay right on the ball and keep the fire going full blast when you need it, the train is, you know, two-cylinder steam engine, and each time it fires, it has a tendency to suck the fire right through the flues, mm -hmm. and uh, you make the, and the steam by going through the flues and make the, but if the fireman doesn't keep enough fire in the fireworks, the flues will get a blast of cold air. That will cause them to crack. Mm -hmm. They're red hot because that bunker number two is burning in there, 2,000 degrees or whatever. They're just red hot, almost white hot. And if he fails to increase the fire when you're going up a hill or something, and it sucks a bunch of cold air in into the firebox, it'll crack the flues. Then you're in trouble because the flues start to leak water from the boiler back into the firebox, mm -hmm. eventually putting the fire out. Yeah, okay. And so, so they have ironmongers, steam fitters. Who that, worked in the blacksmith shop. Well, they work in the uh, down the roundhouse in mm -hmm. Bend. They come out from Bend. Mm -hmm. These men go into the firebox while it's still red hot and hammer those flues. They have a flare. It's a flared fitting. Mm -hmm. and they hammer these flues. They got two inch and four inch. Well, they're still malleable. They're so red hot. These men climb in this little firebox about six feet square and hammer them back down. They rivet them back down so they don't leak. Wow. Standing on uh, soaked burlap bags that actually catch fire sometimes. Sounds like a dangerous occupation. Tough job. Yeah. They got paid $15 an hour back in those days. And those days were uh, when? Back in the 30s, 20s and 30s. $15 an hour, that's good pay. You're darn right. <laughs> of course, they might not live very long. <laughs> Some of them didn't. Yeah. Uh, but the blacksmith shop in the camp was a... a on, a, on a railroad car like the rest of them. And it was a, a vital place. Huh? Mm -hmm. They had a, a machine shop. Like I said, the machine shop and the blacksmith shop were combined. And then they had a carpenter shop that was more like a garage. It wasn't quite as large. And uh, filers shop and was that separate? The saw, filer, the saw filers had individual buildings that were equipped primarily just well, they were made just to saw, to file saws. They had as high as four or five saw filers at one time. Was that a pretty good paying occupation? Yeah, they would get $10 an hour, something like that, back in the 30s. Is that right? Because they were essential to keep the saws so they cut yeah. good. And these buildings that were 16 by 20, they had racks for all the saws. They had as much as 20 or 30 different teams, partners. Of running, they'd have two or three saws for each group of fallers. Mm -hmm. And where the saw filer did the filing, it had a huge vise that was mounted under a skylight. They had a skylight that ran the full width of the building. Mm -hmm. It was plain, ordinary windows that usually go up and down, but in the skylight, so he could see you sure. see well enough to. Well, what about medical facilities? Uh, uh, were there, in the event that somebody got injured, was there something that you could bring somebody to uh, in the camp? And, and my, uh, my dad was, uh, you know, the camp timekeeper, and uh, at first he had uh, medical supplies like gauze and 
Vanderbilt's ointment became very popular. An old Doc Vanderbilt made a ointment that had a lot of eucalyptus. Okay, in it. yeah, mm -hmm. the Vanderbilt from down on the Little Issues River. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And he had jaws and iodine. God, had iodine was hot. And uh, you know, the, they had first aid. They started with first aid back in the forties. Prior to that, they're, yeah, they're, you got your first aid someplace else in town. Yeah, you'd, you'd haul them to band, you know, as quickly as you could. But okay. in, 90, in the early 40s, the company decided to build an ambulance. <laughs> they built an ambulance out of an old Ford, I think it was about a 1941 Ford panel. Mm -hmm. They painted it white and inside and out and put on a red cross. They found out that that was illegal to put a red cross on there because they didn't have the, the affiliation. Uh, yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, you know, uh, they didn't have an actual ambulance driver or anything. My dad usually drove them. Well, was this ambulance uh, something that traveled the roads or was it attached yeah, to it, the rails? Yeah, it was a uh, uh, just a rubber tired. Okay. Uh, 1941 panel that was, and it had a. Uh, gurney and uh, they had a way of attaching a gurney to the side of the inside of it. Well, you know, without attempting to sound too ignorant, was uh, work in the woods pretty dangerous? Uh, did men wind up getting maimed and maimed and crippled or killed? Uh, well, that, you know, they did back when I was a little kid. I guess it was quite prevalent, but uh, because they were using that high lead type logging and. The cable would come down, and if you weren't familiar with where the cable lay, if you were, say the, the log was over here, and the ledger wood is over here, and you'd been pulling line like that, and all of a sudden that line had been like that, and you're standing here, and they tighten the line, you'd get caught in the bite of the line, they call it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it decapitates people. What was a widow maker? It's a piece of a of a tree, usually a dead limb up near the top. And if you don't realize it's there when they fall it, the limb may go some other direction than the rest of the tree and drive you right in the ground. Uh, was that a common occurrence? Not as common as... Uh, I mean... <laughs> You got a uh, uh, like Darwin. <laughs> if you had good followers, you you didn't you didn't have rambunctious, crazy followers that got to be very old. Yeah. You had good followers that were careful, mm -hmm. and they got to be the old followers. Otherwise, you were an old follower unless you were careful. Yeah. And they knew how to. So if a, if a man was you know, hurt or killed in the woods, uh, you know, prior to the time of this ambulance, how, how would that person be taken into town? Most of the access out to the woods was maintained by the railroad. And in that earlier time, my father told me that if a man was killed out in the woods, they would load him onto the cow cage. There was a space between the cow catcher and the front end of the boiler on the steam locomotive. They would lay him in there and cover him with a tarp. Mm. And then when they went back to camp or back to bend, whichever there was at it, the end of the day or something. Yeah. Yeah. They'd haul him in then. Well did was there a loggers hospital in Bend? Yeah. By uh, that the two companies, Brooks Scanlon and Shevlin Hickson had? Um, it was right at where Colorado, the east end of Colorado, the bridge that goes across the river, right at Colorado, right across from Honkers now, where okay. Millet, right. there was a big gray building built on the other side of the road called the Lumberman's Hospital. And so seriously injured loggers or mill workers, would that's where they would go. Yeah, and they were, <laughs> they were maintained there. The company maintained a, a nurse and a... Uh, Jim Donnelly, I think his name was, he was a manager and uh, he kept the hospital going and 
he had a main nurse called Hulda, Hulda Lammers. She used to live in the house next to the pillbox out here at mm. Thurden and uh, Franklin. And uh, she was the head nurse. And I think they had about 30 or 40 beds in that hospital. That's quite a few of it. Yeah. it so <clears throat> working in the woods, uh, just kind of give me a rundown. I don't know. How could you get, how, how did men get hurt in the woods? Oh, there's so many ways. That, that's amazing. Uh, when I, I'm just familiar with when they started using the caterpillar. I, I drove caterpillar. I set chokers. Setting chokers is a dangerous job if you're not trained because you put the cable around the log so the caterpillar can pick it up with the main line and drag it into the landing. And if you go to set a choker where a log is laying on a little hill or something, and while you're bent down under the log, putting the, the fastener, which they call a D, into the buckle like they, they buckle together, uh, okay, so besides injuries that could have occurred during choker setting, what other kinds of injuries could occur uh, by what waves in the wound? Um, I recall one injury where it was fatal. A man that was working uh, with me up on um, Fair Lake area where the they were logging in an area where white pine out uh, white fir was about uh, 16, 80, 18 inches in diameter and they grew about four or five feet apart real thick heavy growth of white fir and uh, we always came in to eat lunch at landing, and this choker setter was following a uh, drag of logs behind the caterpillar. And I guess he wasn't watching, but the logs would catch on a stump and swing. And one of the logs caught on a, lo on a stump and swung over and hit a, a snag. That snag fell down against another snag, and the top broke out and hit this individual right on top of the head. So it was like a widow maker yep. either way, huh? Wow. And drove him right to the ground. Wow. Wow. People, men cut themselves often with axes or saws or... Oh, they, they, they do minor cuts. When they first got the power saws, they had you know, a few bad accidents for the cutting their legs and feet. This was after the Second World War for the most part? Yeah. Uh, back in the old days, of, you know, the old misery whip, you didn't, it just laid there until you picked it up. You had to be careful with that, too, because yeah. it was like, extremely sharp. Yeah. Okay. So for the most part, there was, you know, generally a fairly sizable population with numerous buildings out in the middle of the forest, and the forest is sometimes very prone to burning. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Shevlin Hickson have policies and procedures to guard and protect its property from fire? Yeah, it, it was usually, the camp was usually located in an area that's been cleared off, and there was no opportunity for a forest fire to get to the camp, but we did have a problem with overheated stoves and a few houses burned in camp. Yeah, I noticed in uh, that uh, little biography that, that you had given me, one of the pictures in the, the back of it shows a picture of a burned house and underneath mm -hmm. the caption read, A Common Occurrence. Yeah, uh, it was in the wintertime. Uh -huh. they, uh, they've had quite a number of... And <laughs> back Let's see, where was that? It was at the uh, Chamont camp. They came up with the idea of having a old fashioned hand pump. And they had developed to, to the point where they had fire hydrants 
Mm -hmm. They had this rubber tired uh, fire truck that was uh, pulled <laughs> by people. I, oh, yeah. This is strange. I can't understand why they wanted them like that. They could have got a, a truck and put, put a pump on that, but this thing was an antique, I guess, and they had, they had that old fashioned oh, right. <laughs> hand so pump. Did they have hydrants located uh, throughout the camp yes, in the uh, event that a structure caught on fire? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, how many of them would you suppose there were? Hydrants? Yeah. Oh. Were they strategically placed? Yeah, uh-huh. There was probably 50. 50 of them, man. Yeah, all over camp. Okay. So it sounds like uh, availability to water was pretty good in the event that uh, a structure caught on fire. Mm-hmm. It was. Okay. Uh, but you had to go and <clears throat> okay, now was the the water pressure in those hydrants? Uh, it's just a matter of kicking the valve and mm -hmm. you had and, water. Uh, the, the pine camp, we had problems with water pressure because of the supervisors being the engineers. They didn't understand hydraulic engineering, and they started with that wooden six-inch wooden pipe up near Plano Lake and it graduated down to a four-inch steel pipe. But they didn't put in the safety valves or the pressure valves. And uh, When they first opened it up and used it, we had 180 pounds pressure. Most cities have 40 pounds pressure. So people would have the hot water tanks that were designed for a maximum of 90 pounds pressure would come into their kitchen early in the morning and their hot water tank had split open. Oh boy. And ashes floating a foot deep all over the floor. <laughs> That's one of the calamities, you could, mild calamities you could have. So most of most of the buildings that, that caught fire uh, in the camps were they homes and, and they caught fire because of, of uh, the stoves and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was a camp ever in danger from a forest fire? No. It wasn't. Uh, uh, I think they had learned a lot from the time they were back in Minnesota and they had those huge fires that mm -hmm. overran the entire city. Yeah. Yeah. My, well, my reason for asking is because it seems like there were several in the area that. that were endangered. I think there was one down around Chiloquin one time mm -hmm. that burned to the ground. Uh, seems like it was called Pine Ridge. Uh, and that, you know, people kind of hurried in getting their possessions and burying mm -hmm. them with the hopes of not losing them. Well, I, now that you remind me, there was a, when I had the smaller camp, there was a time my parents told me that uh, there was danger of a camp being overrun by a forest fire over there near uh, Kiowa Springs in that area and uh, Spring River area in that area and uh, people that had uh, sewing machines mm -hmm. dig a hole in the ground and cover them over. So anything that was valuable yeah. was probably... Well, I think one lady put her canaries down the hole. That wasn't too bright. <laughs> well, might not have made it otherwise anyway either, but... Yeah, now, now that you remind me, that, that that did occur back... But you see, I was thinking, I can't really describe things that I don't know about. Of I was no. it, It'd be unfair to you and me, and, but I know about the camps that I lived in. Of course, yeah. And starting back in the 30s. And I don't I don't know about those, so I like I say, I, don't, I didn't know mm -hmm. if... Uh, forest fires were a danger or... I think they were way, way back when they built it, you know, like I said, there's a spurs laying mm -hmm. out through the forest. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't like the older camps where you had 16, 20-foot roads running all around the camp to start with. And then, uh, you know, uh, railroads and uh, all those places were cleared of any type of burning material. Do you ever remember a forest fire coming close to one of the camps you lived in, or no? Or they outside of that sphere, huh? Yeah, they, they 
Of course, I nearly set fire to the roundhouse once. No, you did, huh? When I became a hostler, the very first time I started steam locomotive by myself, you have to throw a, a ball of cotton waste. That's uh, just strings of material. They're soaked in kerosene. You light it and throw it into the firebox. Mm -hmm. And then you turn on the oil valve that shoots the oil into the burning waste, and that's how you start the fire in a steam locomotive. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have enough pressure left over from the last time you started the fire to atomize the oil as it lands on the fire. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I had to open it up a little wider. Well, the oil ran in and hit the waste and caught fire, and because I didn't have that pressure to keep it back in there, it ran out the front of the firebox onto the ties and caught fire. Luckily, there was an old one-armed fireman, Art Van Tessel. He saw what was going on, or he knew what was going on. He came over and helped me back, put the fire out and back the engine off the fire. <laughs> or I would have burned up a roundhouse and three steam locomotives. Right, that, that would have been bad news. <laughs> I may be living somewhere else. <laughs> okay, we, we touched briefly on uh, forms of entertainment during the course of our conversation. What other kinds of uh, community entertainment were available to the folks of New Care? Dancers and Pinochle was really, we had groups of people that would play Pinochle together. And uh, Pinochle was a real popular game. Now, did, did this occur at uh, the community center, or was it something people did at you know, it between friends, you know, two or three, three or four different uh, families would trade off, and they'd go around Robin, or, mm -hmm. and they'd have, you know, it has a uh, light lunch and everything. And uh, you mentioned the community center. Were there activities that occurred there uh, uh, besides the dance? They used okay, to have dances. They had the dances. So yeah, and some of the thought, uh, were they live bands? Oh or? yeah, Bill Ricks. He was the carpenter. He played banjo. Okay. And uh, folks from within the community yeah. played the, the instruments. Ma the make Maker family all knew how to play instruments. Okay, so so you wouldn't necessarily get uh, oh musicians from outside no, the community uh, to come in. Okay. N normally they could do it themselves. Oh, that's great. And then uh, as soon as transportation became popular back in the 30s, 36s. Uh, They'd, be, they'd go down to the Grange Hall, like Fort Rock Grange Hall, mm -hmm. or uh, Grubbs Hall was a dance hall south, halfway between the Pine and Gilchrist. And uh, then they had a big dance hall in the Pine, and, and they, Saturday night dances were really something, because there was always a lot of imbibing of alcohol, and one individual that thought he was tougher than anybody else and try to whip somebody else. That was, was this in camp or was this at some uh, of the other places? Port Rock was a great place for the loggers to fight the cowboys. Oh, it was. <laughs> Conflict of cultures there. Right, right there. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, what about winter activities? Uh, were there organized things uh, during the winter uh, when Things were perhaps well. They were colder and yeah. We we'd go down uh, at La Pine and down at uh, at the Timbers Camp, uh, right down on the ditch. It freeze and a lot of people. Were, these Minnesotans were great for ice skating. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ice skate, and there was uh, skiing, cross country skiing. We didn't realize we were doing cross country skiing. We were just out skiing for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. Did uh, uh, Chevron Hickson sponsor any of the activities or no. put in any funds or anything? Uh, 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 the only thing that they used to do is uh, sponsor a kind of a little league baseball okay. for the kids. You know. Okay. Yeah. Well, they had a they had a, a mill team, didn't they? Oh yeah. It seems I mean, like I remember reading something in the Equalizer uh, about. Uh, 
matches between the mill team and the mm -hmm. logging team or something. Yeah. I, I, those existed? Yeah, oh, yes, but I, I'm not familiar oh, with them. okay, I'm sorry. Because that was back in the 20s. Okay, see? that was before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I know they did exist. And at one time, my father was a basketball coach okay. for uh, the team from camp, and they would play band. And uh, at one time, they had a championship involved somewhere there. And in fact, Lapine High School won the, uh, what was it, the A- they were the A team for basketball in the state of Oregon, in La Pine, in 1936. Lee Maker was on that team. I think they had seven kids uh, on, a, on the team. And uh, they, well, and this is probably, you know, probably before your time also. What about company picnics? Well, I remember hearing them, uh, hearing about them. And I've seen a lot of pictures of them, and uh, they held them down at Benham Falls, and they'd take a train load of people out from Bend, and but there again, alcohol got involved to the point where an individual was run over by the train, and that was the end of that. Mm, okay, uh, <coughs> those were active, but that kind of activity was sponsored. Sponsored by the company. They yeah. furnished all the ice cream and watermelon and yeah. stuff you could. Buy. You know, they and were so maternalistic, uh, you know, they, everybody just felt like a big family and the company would take care of you. Suddenly, mm -hmm. the family wasn't there. Yeah. The company sold out. Yeah. And one individual committed suicide over that. Was that right? Is somebody high up in the company? or? Well, he was my supervisor. His name was Prokopovich, George Prokopovich. He had his name changed to George Prokey because he didn't like the bitch on the end. And when they sold out, he sat around and brooded for a couple of weeks. They came into town and bought a revolver and drove out on Butler Market Road and blew his brains out. Mm. Well, when when the company sold out, did that did it come as a surprise to the folks? Absolutely. They, the folks didn't know that they were going to fold or move on or anything at all? They said it was a case of a flip of a coin. I don't know if it, that's a true story, but they, cause it could have gone either way. I talked to Brooke Scanlon, and uh, uh, what they basically told me was that, you know, operating in a, uh, the capitalistic society that we did, uh, gentlemen's handshakes and flips of coins between large corporations were non-existent. <laughs> so it was it was apparently something that uh, was known about. Uh, yeah, well, it, one of the two companies had to quit logging. That was the way they finally decided, and uh, and either Chevron didn't have enough guts or because. Shevlin had just rebuilt their mill. Mm -hmm. That was an unusual thing that Shevlin had rebuilt their sawmill, and Brooks Gannon bought Shevlin out. They rebuilt the mill back in '48, and mm -hmm. Brooks Gannon bought them out in 1950. I mean, they sold out to Brooks Gannon in 1950. Mm -hmm. Well, Shevlin had the advantage of about four or five hundred yards more of space in the mill pond because of the shovel being on the west side of the river and the brand new mill. Mm -hmm. But uh, Brooks Gallon didn't want anything to do with anything that said shovel with Hickson. There was this animosity between the two companies there was. that went clear back to Minnesota, I guess. Mm. And rather than move everything into the Chevron mill, which was practically brand new, and uh, at least a third larger, maybe half again as large, Brooks Scanlon built, rebuilt their mill mm. at a real high expense. They tore out all the timbers and replaced it with structural steel, mm -hmm. which cost them millions of dollars. And all they had to do was cross that bridge. Well, let, let's get back to the to their closing, uh, Shevlin Hickson closing, 
How much advance notice were folks given that it was? They picked up the bed bulletin. It said Shevlin has sold to Brooks Scanlon. And that was the first people knew about it. That was it. Huh. That's interesting. And my dad didn't even know about it. So that was the first notice we had when we picked up the Ben Bulletin that afternoon. And so after they picked up that paper and found out about it, how long was it until logging operations ceased? Well, they had to bring in all the logs that had been fell. That was around the uh, first part of December. They quit falling, and it took until the end of December to bring in all the logs that they had fell. So, uh, what did people do? Where did they go? Uh, they moved out of camp, and some were given jobs in Brooks Gallon. A few, I mean, uh, 20, 30 percent maybe got jobs working for Brooks Gallon. And Brooks Gallon wasn't, we were at the, uh, uh, Shamalt camp. We were moving into the Timbers camp. We were building the Timbers camp at the time. And uh, we were still down on 97 where Brooks Gannon was logging at Pine Mountain. So one of the first things they did is they wanted to transport all the caterpillars. They had about 20, maybe 22 caterpillars, logging caterpillars. They wanted to move them to location where they were down on the, the west side of Walker Rim down in that area uh, over to uh, the Pine Mountain location which is about well, maybe 60 miles cross country hmm. and so they, they decided to walk them. Uh, is that right? They walked them. It uh, took about a month wow. and in the process they lost one or two Caterpillars. Hmm. They don't know where they went. They're gone. Huh. Was the eight caterpillars. Was this, uh, did this become uh, the property of a caterpillar driver, you suppose, or a bitter caterpillar driver? Or like that guy in the boat in the last couple of weeks, he'd been collecting heavy equipment all over the northwest here. Somebody just took off. They mommy probably got a low boy and, and got it in there and, and took one of those while they were resting overnight. They didn't drive them at night, of course. They, yeah. they just drive them slowly all day. And it took about months to move them over to Pine Mountain and we started skidding on my Pine Mountain. Hmm. So after, you know, kind of decades of a paternalistic attitude towards its employees uh, and then this immediate notice of closure uh, were there some pretty bitter feelings uh, amongst yeah. the employees? Boy it was a shock and then when they hired these shoveling people to work with the Brooks Gallon people there was animosity between the two you know that isn't the way we used to do it for shoveling well you're not working for shoveling now mm. you know that type of thing and well we don't waste our time doing that well this is a what you better learn the new way mm. And a lot of a lot of the practices at Brooks Gallon, since I work for both of them, I know what happened, and uh, there was a lot of practices at Brooks Gallon, a lot of waste of time and effort and things. That Shevlin made money because they were on the ball, and when you went out to work, you worked. Yeah. And a lot of the people that we met for Brooks Gallon, the first, especially supervisors. You know, they go out there and sit in the pickup, mm -hmm. fall asleep, sitting in the pickup, mm -hmm. waiting for that. And if something screwed up, well, they come out and holler and throw their hat on the ground and scream. <laughs> well, that's all interesting to me, man. I didn't realize that, that when uh, Shevlin Hickson shut down, it was that rapid of an occurrence. I, I thought that people were more informed about it, but apparently it was like that. that. That's why. Prokey, you see, he had just he had worked on the steel gang all of his life, and he finally became a supervisor. I was driving the crummy, and he sat next to me as the supervisor, and we were arranging the, the actually the roundhouse and the switching area down there in the new camp. 
getting ready for moving up to the Timbers camp when he uh, he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Let's back up here a little bit. Uh, when when did folks generally take their vacation? Uh, oh, that's another interesting thing. The uh, introduction of the union, IWA, CIO. Which was when? Well, they came in in the uh, early 40s. Okay, so during the Second World War. Yeah, and uh, there was a lot of... Uh, some people said the union would have never come in if if the supervisor didn't show partiality to certain individuals. Mr. Wenton, if he was a gun nut, and if you were a gun nut, that helped. If you had a good good looking wife, and I don't know what what occurred. I've tried to figure it out, but. That, that was part of it. If you had a good-looking wife, you got a good job. Mm. <laughs> so that was primarily one of the reasons the union was brought in. Mm. Okay. And uh, seniority. Uh, I think back in the old days, back in the 20s, they may have taken a week off around 4th of July or something like that. Mm -hmm. But as the union came in, you earned your vacation I think you had to work five years under the union before you got a week, and then if you worked ten years, you got two weeks vacation. Paid vacation? Yeah, yeah. usually during the middle of the summer. Oh, you, you couldn't choose when you wanted to take your vacation? No, they all they all shut down about around 4th of July. Okay. And, and was that so they could uh, overhaul the mill or something? And yeah. It was a convenient mm -hmm. time for the mill to... Yeah. They shut down mm -hmm. operations, so they shut down in the woods as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but uh, another thing, I that vacation period uh, varied on different individuals depending upon the type of job. That was one of the things that when I was going to college, and I'd come back and I'd be a replacement for one of the individuals taking care of, like the hostler and the power. Our, uh, the gas station man. They had a ga guy running the gas station, <laughs> and uh, I'd spend a week or two in each spot, see. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to try all different things. You know, uh, and of course this this probably before your time, but uh, you know, for decades the lumber industry was kind of rife with labor dispute. Any any kind of labor disputes that you ever noticed uh, with Shevlin and Hickson uh, with the camps or anything? No, they didn't have too much. But later as the union came in, and of course Brooks Hammond, they went on strike a couple of times. Each time they lost more than they gained. That was later though. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, another thing back in the early days, uh, Shevlin got to the point where they would work continuously the whole year. And one of the things we found out was Brooks Cannon, when they, of course, they, they were using more trucks. They, they got rid of the railroad uh, back in the, oh, I know, was it back in the 50s or 60s. Mm -hmm. The railroad used to run out to Sisters. And they logged out Black Butte and things. But uh, they got rid of the railroad and they started truck logging and they found out that February and March they were impossible sometimes That's where they were logging. So they just down in the muck. Yeah, so Brooks Scanlon shut down completely. And that's about the time when we started getting unemployment insurance too. So that saved our bacon right there. So as far as, as uh, you know, speaking about shutdowns, the, the camps, uh, they operated year-round, huh? Oh, yeah. Whether it, there was snow or muck or mire or uh, fluctuations in timber markets, uh, you didn't ever see any temporary shutdowns in the camps? No, not for shoveling. That was our home, and that was... What about during the Depression? Well, it's, like I say, I don't remember that much about okay. it, but, but uh, they, they just kept operating. Okay. There was a lot more hand labor 
you know, they didn't have all the power that they have now to mm -hmm. do the jobs that they they use a lot of men where they now use a machine. You bet. That seems to always kind of be the drive. You know, mm -hmm. Get a new machine and eliminate ten men. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, what about during the Second World War? Uh, do you recall any differences in the way camps operated or lived, uh, people lived, uh, from before the World War to the time the war came along? Was, let me ask you, put it a different well, way. Did you notice people maybe leaving the camps to go to work in war industries? Or? Yeah, there was a few that did that. Went down Portland shipyards, and you know they could get more, make more money than they could up here. But during the war, Shevlin and Brooks's were considered to be a uh, unnecessary type of material. You know, they were, and they. What they did is increase production. Yeah, sure, you bet. It, there would be an increase in production. That's when, that's when I remember that they started hauling those 80 car loads of logs a day from uh, camp to Bend. Mm -hmm. And they would work, instead of being off on the weekend, you work Saturdays. Yeah, okay. Do you ever remember seeing any uh, bulletins uh, in the camps at the time? In, uh, on bulletin boards about the war effort, and uh, oh, they they published a, in that safety deal a, a few things like that. But uh, you know, every camp I've ever lived in had the Journal and the Oregonian, and uh, we had newspaper boys, and we got the daily paper from Portland. I don't know how it happened, but. Hmm. But we, you know, we were well aware, or well aware of what was going on, and uh, that was another thing about Stanley Linton. He was a great baseball fan from back east. See, mm -hmm. so we would get the delivery of the Oregonian on the stage going from Bend to Silver Lake. Our mail would come to the camp at uh, Summit Camp. Mm -hmm. And they would throw out the, they'd have a stack of about 50, 40 or 50 Oregonians that a kid would deliver. And invariably, Linton would get there before the kid, and he'd take his paper out and look at the baseball score. And every day, that kid would cuss him out. You took that paper out of my stuff. <laughs> he said, no, I got to count him over. <laughs> but as a rule, you don't, you don't remember uh, much in the way of a migration from the logging camps to other areas to no. the, during the war as far as people working in war industries? No, there were just a few. Uh, I don't know. People figured they could make more money welding for Henry Kaiser than they could cutting logs. What do you think? Well, some of them did. And, uh, but that was Kind of like you live in a great big family, you live in the camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so unusual now because you don't know 700 people. I mean, I don't know 700 people. I did then. Mm -hmm. I what, knew them all. Wasn't, wasn't any problems in the camp? Oh, yeah, there was a few. Yeah, was, was, well, in terms of Oh, well, let me just say, was there any, you know... Marital any problem? Marital problems, crime, yeah. crime, theft, yeah. burglary. Yeah, there's yeah. one timber faller. His buddy said, boy, he said, you better stay home. Or He said, why don't you go to work and leave your car out here and, and go back in after you start work and see what's going on. And he did that. And he caught a, he got another guy in bed with his wife. Mm. And he had a shotgun, and he shot him right in the groin. <laughs> they picked out uh, 12, I think he used number six shots. He picked out about 12 shots out of his scrotum. <laughs> Didn't blow it off, but he was aiming there. <laughs> Incapacitated him for a while anyway. Yeah. Huh? Huh. Uh, we haven't talked about this, but what kind of work did you do? Uh, you mentioned that you were a bulldozer operator. Uh, well, I started by setting. Well, I started first when I was 16, picking rocks out of the. They were changing over to trucks for hauling 
They were hauling logs down to the railroad with trucks. And they started about 1946. Oh, 1946. And uh, the first job I had with them was uh, pitching boulders and, or big, big cinders out of the truck road. So they they get them stuck between the duels and they blow out the tires. And another thing, they had built truck roads over railroad grades. They had flattened out a railroad grade and make it into a truck road. Like, like Brooks Gallon, Road 18 that goes clear out to China Hat. Right. Is on a, the main railroad grade. Right. Well, <laughs> millions of spikes left. <laughs> and they had headaches with spikes killing those you know, three or four hundred dollar tires. I'll bet. <laughs> so they hired people like me to pitch the spikes out. Uh, go out and find them and pitch them. Huh? Yeah. You just walk along and they'd be laying right there. Well, what else did you do? Well, that's how I started, and then I started setting chokers behind the cast. And uh, a choker setter gradually works his way up to driving a cat. And I learned to drive a cat for shoveling. I, I was able to move them. I wasn't a cat driver. I was just able to move them around, and I knew how to do it. Well, when Shevlin was sold out to Brooks's, one of the first jobs I had, I met Cecil Allison. He was a supervisor, and he wanted to load a D7 Caterpillar on a flat car, take it to bed, and then later out to Pine Mountain. And uh, he said, can you load that? Well, hell, I knew how to start him, and I knew a little bit about running him. And I said, sure. And I got on that cat, and I loaded it for him. And he said, okay, you're a cat driver now. And I said, okay. And the next day that I used it, I don't remember where it was. It was in the wintertime in December. I just parked it when I got through driving it. And I left all the snow in the tracks. That snow froze right in the tracks. And that made that cat, you couldn't move it because it was frozen solid. Mm. And he said, next time you'll learn to clean out your tracks. In the wintertime, you have to clean the mud and the snow out of the tracks every time when you park it. Well, I didn't know that because I wasn't experienced. He handed me a pickaxe and I spent about two hours n knocking the ice and snow out of it. But when I was working for Shevlin, I uh, moved from uh, saying chokers to working on landing. That was the next, uh, you unhook the chokers so that the hookers can load the logs onto the, onto the truck. Mm -hmm. And that's where I saw another accident where my schoolmate, high school mate, was working on one side of the landing, I was working on the other. I was unhooking the chokers from the logs. He was doing the same thing. It was on a hillside. And his name was Kenny Moorhead. And Kenneth had had infantile paralysis. That was one of the reasons they had him on the landing. And one leg was about four inches shorter than the other, so he walked with the limp all the time. And he wasn't too fast on his feet. But he had a huge chest, about a 50 inch chest. Well, in the process of unhooking the logs, one of the logs broke loose and caught him while he was trying to run away from him. And that log ran the full length of his body. When it ran over his chest, and over his head, his ears popped blood right out of his ears. They thought he was dead, but the landing was soft enough, and his chest was big enough that it protected his head when the log rolled over. Mm. And all he, he was only off for about a week. Is that right? Well, he's lucky, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. so, how long, how long did you actually work in the woods, uh, Clint? Well, that depends now. Yeah, part of it, my life, I've been on a Caterpillar since 1950 when I got on to load that. I got oh, off of a Caterpillar in 1990. Oh, uh -huh, okay. Forty years. Okay. And in the process, I worked for Brooks Gallon up until 1964. Mm -hmm. I went to the Peace Corps and I spent two years in the Peace Corps from 64 to 66. And when I came back in 66, I joined the Forest Service. Okay. So about a 15-year period of time there, yeah. would you say? The, yeah. 
that you worked for, either Shevlin Hickson or yeah, or Brooks Scanlon. Scanlon. Okay. And in that process, I helped. Uh, I moved up to the the highest uh, position they had for manual labor operating a caterpillar road building, and I helped build the roads up Black Butte. I helped build the main logging road that uh, now is a uh, Ouija golf course that went yeah. through. Okay, was that for Brooks Scanlon? Yeah, Brooks Scanlon. Yeah. We went all the way from here to, all the way from here to Odell and Crescent Lake and uh, south to Walker Mountain uh, by Shamal. And you'd mentioned that you'd been a hostler. What, what did a what does a hostler do? He takes care of the steam locomotive. When the engineer and the fireman bring the steam locomotive in and shut it off, and, uh, they they usually park it under the water uh, spout they have, a, and the hostler gets up on the tender and puts the water in the tender, and then hooks up the steam pump to pump. Uh, bunker number two fuel oil into the whale re part of the tender and then you call up on the boiler and those two big domes mm -hmm. they have the smokestack then you have a dome mm -hmm. and then you have the whistle mm -hmm. and the bell and another dome those big big domes are about three feet in diameter about three feet high contain sand the hostler takes a bucket of sand each <laughs> one at a time, and sets them up there and dumps them in the in the sand domes. And what are the sand? What, what purpose does that serve? The sand goes down by air. It's conducted by an air tube to either the front or the rear of the drivers. And uh, these the Mikados had eight drivers, and I mean four drivers on each side. So. They just open the little valve, the engineer opens the valve, and then it'll spill sand on the track to get traction. Oh, so, oh, so it's so in the a rainy, traction device. Yeah, in the rainy days, you're busy hauling sand. Okay, so as, as a hostler, that's what you're, that's part of your job. Maintenance of the steam locomotive. And then after you get the sand and the water and the oil in, you run them in the roundhouse and park them under those vents that... Uh, uh, take care of the steam and the smoke off, mm -hmm. and you raise the uh, oil up to where you're burning a lot of oil and, and you're creating a lot of steam pressure. Shevlin had uh, superheated steam locomotives that operated on 210 pounds of pressure. So the hostler runs the pressure up to the point where the the whistle, not, not the whistle, but the pop-off, pop-off valve would release. If a guy ain't higher than 210, it'd blow it. Mm. Well, you got to bring it up to about 208 or 209 and then shut everything off and close it up tight. It will sit there that way. The pressure gradually drops down to about 40 or 50 pounds mm -hmm. in six to eight hours. And then you have to do the whole process. You got to build a fire and bring it back up. So when you throw that cotton swab saturated in diesel or then, whatever, uh, you've got yeah. the pressure all ready to go. Yeah, you got to okay. have a little pressure. Okay. And Shevlin never had any way figured out to start them from cold. That was one of the innovations that Brooks Scanlon brought out that I thought was quite unique. They mounted a uh, air compressor next to the roundhouse and they hooked it up to the steam system and they would build up air pressure to replace the steam pressure and they were able to start a locomotive from cold without having any steam. Let me ask you, <coughs> uh, did, were different locomotives used on the main line than were used on the spurs? Yeah, they had, uh, Chevron had well, the one and the three were Shays. Shay locomotives that had the three-cylinder gear-driven engine. Okay. And uh, the the cylinders were set at uh, 45 degrees on the 
size of the engine. I can show you pictures. I've got pictures. And and uh, yeah, I'd like to see some sometimes. But uh, they went to this Baldwin Mikado because the Shea is so slow. Well, the one they have at Primeville, mm -hmm. the one they bought, uh, it used to work at Mount Emily logging outfit. It's a Shea, and it it stopped top speed. I think at 18 miles an hour. But is so it wouldn't have been a mainline locomotive. No, it, I, I mean that's the type of logging locomotive they used way back in the 1890s. See, uh, but well, it had extra power for steep yeah, grades. Yeah, <clears throat> and that was that was a geared yeah, locomotive. A geared locomotive, as opposed to a rod locomotive. Yeah, uh -huh. and the rod locomotives then were mainline locomotives. Is that right? Well, they found out that they needed more power and uh, faster moving machine. And they went to the uh, the Baldwin side rod type, and the, they had the two. Uh, they call them two spot, two foot, and the four, and the five, and the six, and the seven, and the eight. Now, Why do they call them spots? I don't know. It's, you, you just say the two spot. I mean, it's just that's all I've heard all my life. You you call an engine a two spot. You take a number and call it spot. I don't know. Did it have a number on it? Oh yes, they all had numbers. Maybe it was a, a number in a circle. Yeah, it was. And but so it was the eighth spot. Yeah, the, now the eighth spot was an unusual engine. It was a mainline engine that ran from Ben to wherever the camp was, and it was a little larger to start with. It was just a, the newest one, and it was a little larger than all the others they used out in the woods. And uh, in some of these photographs, you can see it. There was a little difference between all. They all had their own uh, kind of intricacies. I mean, they were different. Each each engine was different. And uh, the eight spot was rebuilt to haul these eighty cars, mm -hmm. and it was almost doubled in size. Mm -hmm. And it looked big when they got through rebuilding it. But yeah, I mean, at first glance, you wouldn't notice it. But it ran from Ben to Shamal, or Ben to Ben up there. To we had the camp up there at Summit. Mm -hmm. You told me a little story here last time I talked to you about, you know, after Shevlin Hickson sold out to Brooks Scanlon, and and you and your folks were left down at at Shamal.